It happened without warning. The bombs fell. Everything fell to ruin. And almost immediately, I forgot what the sun looked like. A cloud of soot rose from the aftermath, and the entire planet became cold. So cold, most of the plants died. Food's been hard to come by, and if that wasn't enough, the heating of the stratosphere destroyed the ozone layer. So even without seeing the sun, if I go out unprotected, I'll be burned. I'm cold, I'm hungry, I'm alone. And this is my story. This is how I survived 77 days in a nuclear apocalypse. Day one. I had to learn things quickly. I put on my gas mask and an old hoodie and went outside. Everything was covered in dirt and soot, and there wasn't a soul around. I took shelter in an old, long, unused subway station that had been sealed off from the public. With radiation everywhere, I knew that would be the least exposed place I could find. It'd be safe while I tried to find other survivors. The further underground I went, the safer I'd be from any future bombs. After all, I had no way of knowing if this was really over. Day two. I set up an old radio I found in a security booth and left it on. If anyone was alive, this was the only way I'd know. I was lucky to find an undamaged water purifier in an old warehouse store. All the water sources had become contaminated with radiation, and I'd need it if I wanted to live longer than a few days. I needed information. I needed to know where the bombs fell. I couldn't risk leaving in any direction until I knew there was somewhere safe I could go. I scanned the radio frequencies, but no one was broadcasting. Day four. I found some old agricultural books in an indoor greenhouse beneath a local cannabis dispensary. With any luck, I'd be able to grow my own vegetables. Has to be better than the canned beans I've been eating. It's getting colder outside. I found some old winter clothing in a local mall. Scavenging resources is pretty much all I can do for the time being. Day 10. I have to make my visits to the surface count. Going outside has become incredibly dangerous. The ozone layer was destroyed by the heating of the stratosphere, and as a result, UV radiation is higher than ever. Fortunately, the danger of the nuclear fallout was declining. Within a couple weeks, the area would be safe for travel and decontamination, though I'd still need to cover my skin from the UV rays. Day 21. It was safer to travel outside now, so I sought high ground. I needed to know where the bomb hit and which direction to go. I walked to a popular lookout point that sat just outside the city. It wasn't hard to figure out where the bomb hit. The path of destruction got increasingly worse the closer you got to it. I now knew where to walk away from. However, I didn't know how far I'd need to go. It was too dangerous to risk moving forward without proper supplies. It was time to stockpile everything I could get my hands on, everything that could be safely decontaminated and prepare for my journey. Day 30. A month has gone by. There's not been another explosion to my knowledge, so whatever conflict occurred was over. But I hadn't heard or seen from another survivor yet. If this was a localized attack, there would have been rescue personnel. This told me the damage must have been widespread. I needed to move quickly. I began my journey walking along the subway tunnels. I knew that would at least take me out of the city and keep me safe underground. The subway cars had ceased working due to the EMP from the nuclear blast, just like all electronics. When I reached the end of the subway line, I walked until I found an old truck on the side of the road. I opened the back. Inside was the body of the driver. Looked like he tried to take shelter here. Unfortunately, cars and vehicles don't offer much in the way of protection from the fallout, and this poor guy choked to death. The truck still worked. I was lucky. I kept driving away from the blast. The roads were littered with debris and broken down vehicles, so I had to take things slow. Still, it was faster than my feet, and I'd exert myself much less. Day 40. I've more or less gotten out of the range of the worst of the fallout. By now, I'm estimating I've driven about 300 miles. I won't be going much farther, though. Not without more fuel. And the gas station seemed to be dried up, which tells me one thing. Someone else had the same idea I did. There were other survivors, or at least there were. I had no way of knowing if they were still around, but it was the hope I needed to keep going. Day 50. I haven't found any survivors, but they've definitely been nearby. 
Most of the stores I've looked for supplies at have been looted already. Hopefully it means they're somewhere safe and I just can't find them. I'd like to look in underground areas, but I don't want to risk going into any buildings. Without regular maintenance, any structure could crumble on top of me. Best I avoid taking unnecessary risks. For now, at least. I just hope whoever's out there is friendly. But given how we got into this mess, I wouldn't bank on others acting morally. We need each other to survive just as much as we don't. Day 60. Much to my surprise, the truck radio kicked on today. I couldn't believe it. I replied immediately. Risky, I know. But it was riskier to go alone. I drove the truck to a community center nearly 600 miles from where I'd started. Military medics looked after me and checked my radiation levels. Apparently, I was a lucky one. I was just outside the blast radius, about 45 miles or so. Had I been any slower at seeking shelter, I'd likely have succumbed to the fallout. I'm told at my range, you have approximately three hours to get to shelter. Otherwise, well, I'd rather not think about it. Day 65. The military was finally given an explanation. Apparently some form of government was still functioning, at least as far as the military was concerned. An enemy nation, no one was sure which, fired numerous highly clustered strikes across the United States. Current estimations believe that over 1,000 bombs were launched and that nearly half the population was eradicated. And that's not including anyone who died from fires, injury, starvation, or the fallout from the weapons themselves. Of course, this left us with more questions than answers. Who was responsible? What about other nations? How can we contact our loved ones living far away? Sadly, it looked like we wouldn't have any answers for a long time. The best we could do now is survive and wait. Day 70. I volunteered to assist with recovery and rebuilding efforts. I looked for other survivors, people on the road who might not have been able to find us. The military refueled my truck and gave me some uncontaminated clothing to give to any survivors. Anyone wandering in this might have had their outerwear contaminated with radioactive dust, and we can't have that entering anyone's lungs. Any survivors we found were promptly sent to a showering facility the military had built, to ensure any of their exposed skin wasn't contaminated either. It seemed like we had things under control. The future was anything but certain. Even if there was no further war, the repercussions of our exposure to the nuclear bombs would likely continue long into the future. Not just on the land, but it's well documented that children born after exposure tend to experience genetic damage. And even if they don't, the chance they might contract cancer was a lot higher. But there's nothing we can do to change that now. We have to keep moving forward. Day 77. Decontamination efforts began, but it was unlikely we'd be returning to our homes anytime soon. We were put into a government housing project not far from where we were. It'd still be some time before we'd have certain luxuries again, but the rebuilding effort had begun. But honestly, I was just glad to be alive. Life wouldn't be the same again, but at least we might have a chance for tomorrow. And that's how I survived 77 days in a nuclear blast.